Good afternoon and welcome to Agri-Food Conversations brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Trump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. My name is Tom Bunn. I'm an associate on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm excited to welcome you all to our discussion today. Agri-Food Conversations is all about driving innovation in food and ag. Each month we highlight a specific theme, and this month's theme is food ingredients. On today's call, we are joined by Dr. Alan Samish, founder and CEO of Amai Proteins. Amai develops novel proteins which answer the needs of consumers and industry. The first application is sweet protein, inspired by nature, built with biology through a natural fermentation process that will help food manufacturers reduce sugar by 40 to 70% with minimal environmental impact and exponential taste. It has the same sensory experience as sugar, is quickly digested in the body like protein with no adverse inter interaction. It is also low cost, making it accessible for all. With its pro protein platform, the company creates new breakthroughs which are set to shape the future of proteins. Each of you knows companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We've invited you to this call, this webinar, because you are some of the smartest, most talented people in a my proteins market your potential customers for their products and services. You've built a similar company or you have unique expertise and understand the challenges and opportunities that my proteins may face. Before we get started, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we have on the call today. Please take a moment to answer. Additionally, a few process comments uh, while the poll is running. Uh, we are not soliciting investment in any way whatsoever. This presentation is to provide information to help my proteins find customers, mentors, or other strategic relationships that can help them grow their business. Secondly, you can use the Q&A box to ask a question at any time, and we will answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. Finally, this presentation, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay. So without further delay, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Alan Samish, founder and CEO of Amai Proteins. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Samish. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate the warm welcome and introduction and appreciate the iSelect Fund Agri-Food Conversations and honor to be on this uh, um, special month on ingredients. At um, Amai, we, um, and this is uh, your statement and we'll move to our presentation. At Amai, we make great tasting designer proteins. Amai is actually sweet in Japanese, and Amai Proteins is developing a new field of designer proteins, proteins which we design to fit the mass food market and to fit the customer needs. Our base R&D system is a synergistic combination we called ProCube. ProCube stands for three different things. First of all, we have the Pro Design, which is the AI computational protein design part. And I opened Amai after 18 years in academia, after founding and chairing what became the world's main meeting in computational structural biology, and after publishing what became the main book in the field of computational protein design. I then couldn't stay anymore in academia because I thought that this method is something that can help so much the, our little blue planet and our um, humanity, which needs such solutions. The second part of the ProQ platform is the ProPlanet Precision Fermentation, a sustainable and cost-effective way to produce proteins. Fermentation is one of the oldest technologies in the book. Whether it is beer, wine, kimchi, they are, or yogurt, in all of these cases, we eat or drink all of the content of the fermenter. In precision fermentation, we add a layer of harvesting, and at the end of the day, we harvest from the fermenter and we grow our protein in fungi, in um, yeast, in bacteria, all the possibilities work. And at the end of the day, we harvest out of that a white powder. And then comes pro taste, because our business is to make a white powder which makes people happy. And the first use case is the first sweetener 
and which we can describe it by words such as tasty, healthy, sustainable, and cost effective. And for that, we have a food technology department which incorporates it into uh, consumer packaged goods and into blends targeting the $90 billion sugar industry. The first product goes for the sugar paradox. We all love sugar, but sugar is toxic. Sugar is actually the new tobacco, but alternatives don't deliver on taste, cost, health, and functionality. It is only six years ago that following the pure study that was published in Lancet, we understood that sugar is public enemy number one. The biggest challenge of non-communicable diseases as it underlies a metabolic syndrome of which diabetes and obesity are the most known things. And yet still 90% of the sweetening market is sugar and its ugly stepbrother high fructose corn syrup because all the others simply don't deliver. And yet in the last six years, already 50 countries are implementing sugar taxation to fight what is becoming a huge public burden. And if we go to the biggest uh, public policy health, uh, public health policy makers, we can see that sugar is much more than the uh, obesity and diabetes we all know, from Alzheimer to colon and pancreatic cancer, to kidney disease, to mental issues, not to mention tooth decay and much more. With this in mind, let's go to nature because nature found a solution. Well, in the Garden of Eden, the first seduction of mankind was a sugary apple. But in today's paradise, along the equatorial belt, from Malaysia and China to West Africa, sugar is simply not good enough. You need something more, because in the jungle, you have all the water in the world. Of, you need all the, um, all the fertilizers you need. The real world is about sunlight. The tall canopy covers and in the depth of the jungle, the very word depth is because the plants are afraid to be overshadowed by, um, by the bigger plants. And so shrubs need something more for seduction. We can see that you have here some red fruits, they wear lipstick, so animals from afar can see them. And then instead of sugar, they have something which is much better, much more tasty, and that is a sweet protein which activates our sweet receptor just like sugar. And we have only one sweet receptor, 25 bitter receptors, but only one sweet receptor. But then just like any other protein, these hyper sweet proteins are digested into their amino acid constituents. And consequently, they're actually healthy. No insulin response, no calories, no effect on the microbiome, liver and kidneys. And this is in contrast to all of the small molecule sweeteners. And if this is so good, why aren't we all using them? That is because of three things. They are very costly. You can only grow them in the depth of the jungle. Most of them have very low stability and a suboptimal sweetness profile, above all a lingering taste. What we did is to focus on these issues and to bridge the gap by our ProCube platform to produce the world's sweetest protein which is the most stable um, protein, sweet protein in the world and enables up to 70% sugar reduction while maintaining the full sugar sensory profile. So if we look on all of the attributes we need, the combination of taste, consumer acceptance, and we have done consumer acceptance studies in numerous countries, in the US, in France, in Denmark, Poland, Germany, and of course in Israel, if we look on the ability to really uh, reduce sugar, the low cost and the low caloric density, we actually de facto have no calories. Um, and not less important, sustainability. This is the most sustainable way to grow a sweetener using a factory of microbes. So taken together, we have the best combination of taste, cost, health, low calories and sugar reduction. This is because one teaspoon of our protein is worth 16 kilograms of sugar or one pound is worth uh, uh, <coughs> um, 30 uh, pounds of 
sugar. Um, sorry, one pound is worth two tons of sugar. One kilogram of our protein is worth four tons of sugar. With such low levels, we are actually calorie free. The high potency also means low cost along the entire value and supply chain with a good gross margin. So how do we do that? We do that with a ProCube platform using computational protein design. What is this word, computational protein design? Well, I'm happy to send people the book that I published on the field to get a little bit more on it. But in a glimpse, computational protein design is a way to design on the computer. And we have our own servers. We are also using a lot of very heavy cloud computing. Um, our computational protein design department is led by Dr. Nama Koppelman, a Stanford graduate and a professor of computer science. And we can design proteins which mimic proteins which live in harsh conditions. Because 99.9% .9 of all proteins live in paradise, whether paradise is our body and our DNA can express 20,000 different proteins and whether it is an exotic fruit in the uh, paradise of the jungle where you have sweet proteins. However, the mass food market for a protein is a hell of an environment. So what we do is we look, do you have proteins in hell? And yes, you do. You have life in hell and where you have life, you have proteins. You have life in the depth of the ocean. You have life in the Dead Sea, in hot springs in Yellowstone and in acidic swamps or in Antarctica. In all of these places, you have proteins which have adapted to a very extreme condition. Actually, in the last year, 2021, according to Science and Nature magazines, was the year in which we solved the protein folding problem. And computational protein design is defined as an inverse folding problem because given a structure, you ask what is the sequence that will adhere to it. And just to give you one example, here you have actual experimental structures. You have here a structure of a protein called monelin, actually two such structures in blue. And then you have a bunch of structures called MNEI where these two subunits were joined. And you see that these are what's called random curls all over the place. We rebuilt this loop, we shortened it, we elongated these secondary structures called beta strands. And instead of this random curl, we built a very precise structure called a beta turn. Without getting to too much jargon beyond that, this is just an example, this design element, which is one of several design elements, gave an additional 10 degrees of stability and decrease the lingering taste. So taken together, the My ProCube computational protein design platform allows us to design proteins which are fit to the mass food market, whether it is short-term stability, thermostability, acid stability, um, fat stability, hypoallergenicity, and also other attributes that we are looking at, whether it is uh, making a protein more a whole protein. Then we have a very broad IP protection with four patent applications from the provisional and to the national phase, and we are looking very globally. So we submitted it in 52 countries. I think that at our stage, we are the startups that has the most international awards and grants. I'll show it to you in a minute. We have numerous applications, a well uh, thought regulatory pathway where actually after talks with the FDA, we got from the FDA a um, memo, official memo telling us if you do A, B, C, D, you will get the generally regarded as safe uh, clearance. And actually next year we are beginning sales and this is um, with some help already with numerous fee bearing agreements of which here are just some of the companies we are working with. From beverages to chewing gum to other things and other companies did not want to disclose their names so they're not here. With some of them we have fee bearing agreements, with some of them we have joint non-diluted EU and other grants. So our value proposition is not to compete with the diet market. The diet market is actually small and does not have a good reputation. We are competing with a sugar market. 
we are looking for labels such as same great taste, but 50% less sugar. And actually in some applications, we have much less sugar. And the point is that we have a uh, professional taster panel, all screened according to ISO standards and trained uh, continuously. And we look for products where our professional tasters, which are super tasters or almost super tasters, will not distinguish the product that we make, a my sweetened product from the full sugar product. Here are just some of the applications that we have made. Some of them we've made on our own with our food technology department led by Sam Marcos, a former CTO of SodaStream of Materna, the one that is now a Nestle subsidiary that brought to the world H-tiered infant formula and the CTO of Israel's largest um, dairy. So with him and the team of food technologists and our head of sensory evaluation, from peanut butter to chewing gum to dried fruits, we deliver up to 70% sugar reduction. Now you have in the market ketchup with less sugar, but in our case with 70% less added sugar, you will not note that it is not a full sugar um, formulation. So I spoke a bit on the regulatory side and we are now going to the market first with a self-affirmed grass and then with an FDA notified grass and then to the rest of the world, to Singapore, Brazil, Mexico, and other countries and sales will begin in less than one year. If we look on the competitive landscape of sugar reduction solutions, according to Lux Research, there are eight categories of such solutions from artificial and natural high intensity sweeteners to sugar alcohols, to whole foods, to physical uh, modifications, but all of them simply fail in hitting all of the check boxes that you must have above 30% sugar reduction, which is what is needed to get a sugar reduction labeling. We don't do anything below that. We actually usually begin in much more because they fail in taste, cost, health, stability, and sensory profile. Actually, the American Heart Association put out a strong advisor in 2018, and in quoting, they wrote, there was a dark of evidence and the adverse effects of high-intensity sweeteners, artificial or natural. As to the go-to market and distribution, we are very synergistic. We are not looking to reinvent the wheel. While we may sell directly to large uh, companies, food and beverage multinationals, to all the others, we are looking for distribution partners, and in some cases also for blending partners, as this is a story of blends. Not less important is impact. Impact is something we invest a lot, and this is led by Dr. Shiri Yaniva, our head of impact in R&D collaborations. And we have a two-track quantitative impact plan focusing on health, sustainability development goal three, and on sustainability, which is UN SDG two and several others which are less quantitative because for every 1% decrease in sugar consumption, we not only save 1.7 million metric tons of sugar, and we only need to produce 500 tons of our white powder for that, but we also save two and a half trillion liters of water, $10 billion in healthcare dollars, six and a half million acres of arable land, not to mention that sugar contaminates air, land, and sea, and affects a lower socioeconomic class. So, so far we infused into the company $17.5 million with more money coming in non-dilutive and a uh, series B that I will not talk about uh, here. A word about our leadership uh, team because beyond the computational trading design and our synergistic ProQ platform, we really need a lot of synergy. Our Chief Marketing Officer of Walter Clearhout was a Chief Commercial Officer in Royal DSM Human Nutrition and Health. Our VP Business Development came from Hershey, Unilever, Abbott, Kimberly Clark. Our VP of People came from several international companies working in Israel and abroad. Our VP Finance came from Ernst & Young and from Johnson & Johnson. Our Chief Production Officer came from Teva, uh, Vitamed, 
Um, Rafa Labs and was himself a CEO from all, for almost a decade. I spoke already about LVP food technology, our director of biotechnology already made 150 proteins by precision fermentations, including a large scale. But he spoke about the director of computational protein designs, the director of clinical and regulatory affairs already got in her previous job in a company that is now part of IFF. Uh, work there and then in a company where she got grass or something produced in um, fungi and our director of IP is 20 years in the industry. This is just our leadership. Uh, we have now more than 30 people, eight PhDs. Uh, we have an uh, incredible uh, board that is led by Rick Grubel, the former president of Monsanto Brazil and of uh, Tyson International Business Development and of uh, DSM Human Nutrition and Health, and Dr. Amir Gutman, who ran his own VC for 20 years, is now joining us as part of the team. We have a strategic advisory board of our um, amazing investors from the Singaporean government to uh, several who are uh, sugar traders and an amazing scientific advisory board from Nobel laureate Mike Levitt to my friends and my postdoc advisors, experts in different aspects of what we do. So after we conquer sugar, then we go to other designer proteins and we have actually identified specific designer proteins where we feel that we have a competitive edge. One actually just so happened is in the meat space, one is in the plant space and one is in the milk space. Each one of them is a different ball game. But in all of these cases, we have a protein in nature with amazing functionality, which is not fit to the mass food market as to either price, stability, and stability is not only temperature and temperature short range and long range is a different issue. It can be a hypoallergenicity um, that is needed or a more whole protein. Each case here is something else. All of these right now are in the computational phase and are about to move to the biotechnology phase. The biotechnology is the most expensive part in our company. Just to give you some frame of where we are in this month of talks on ingredients, we are planning to be the fourth ingredient in the um, precision fermentation protein ingredients. There's also Geltor that is not here. Impossible Foods is making the leg hemoglobin, their secret sauce for hamburgers. Perfect Day is doing the beta-lactoglobulin for milk. The Every Company is doing the ovomusoid and other um, um, egg proteins, uh, egg white and others. Um, and those are all ingredients which are already in the um, market and all of them are coming from startups because this is a new disruptive space that is going to conquer the world with much more sustainable and cost-effective methods. By the way, stevia that is done by for precision fermentation, you can do only the WebM or Bodeozide M component of stevia, which tastes better, and the cost is about half of stevia from agriculture. If from the other side, we go look in the combination of computational protein design and proteins, in this case for medical use, we can look on the company called Generate Biomedicine, which was uh, founded, co-founded by Dr. Gavor Gregorian, with whom I enjoyed the postdoc with uh, Bill DeGrado, the guy who uh, invented the field of protein design. And he is part of the flagship pioneering company, a company known as also uh, the uh, company that opened Moderna and a few other companies which are very well known. He already um, just got his first equity round of $370 million. As to uh, some of the awards that we have received, we have received awards across the uh, globe from Asia to uh, the West Coast, from Impact Extreme Tech Challenge to Food Ingredients Global, the world's biggest uh, food ingredients um, exhibition, um, to um, the top uh, uh, startup in Europe and in Israel. Israel, it was the first time it wasn't hardware or uh, software. So to sum up, I just want to say where we are going and we see ourselves as something extremely disruptive. We like very much the definition of moonshots 
that is done by X, the Cisco company of Google. They define moonshot as something that has a huge problem such as sugar overconsumption, a breakthrough technology such as a Procube platform combining the agile integrative computational threading design precision fermentation and food technology to deliver a radical solution, not a me too, but something really disruptive, such as a sweeten sweetener that for the first time you can add to it adjectives such as healthy, tasty, and sustainable. So with that, I thank you and I'll be happy to answer any questions, whether it is the process that we are having or anything else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Samish. Very much appreciated and congratulations on the progress. Um, to those in attendance, <clears throat> a couple of ways to ask questions. Um, perhaps the easiest is to go to the bottom of your Zoom app and click on the Q&A box found in the middle of your screen and type in a question there. Uh, I can read it to Dr. Samish or you can raise your hand on the right side of your screen next to your name and I, I can unmute you and you can ask your question out loud. Uh, but Dr. Samish, I, while uh, our participants are thinking about their questions, uh, can you can you give us a scale as or can you give us a sense of of kind of the scale and um, the cost at which you're you're producing uh, proteins at the moment and what that looks like uh, over time? Yes. So um, next year we are already moving to um, production in the size of tons of white powder, and obviously for that you need quite a big fermentation capacity and it all depends on how much grams per liter you produce and also on how many days each fermentation takes. And filamentous fungi takes a week. Uh, um, unicellular fungi yeast takes five days, others take less. So it all depends and we are playing with a few different uh, systems of production. And within a decade, we are looking to um, have well over a uh, thousand tons, actually every 500 tons annually are roughly 1% uh, of sugar reduction um, that we can, we can solve. So definitely we are talking about large volumes. Uh, precision fermentation is not something that difficult to do. We also have for different systems, different types of fermenters, whether it is a fermenter with impellers or whether it is a bubble tower, so this all depends on what exact process, what exact biotechnology you do. Actually, you already have a hundred different proteins, which are we all enjoy and are used as processing agents, mainly proteins, which are enzymes. For example, chymosine. 99% of the hard cheese, yellow cheese in the world is done with the help of chymosine, small amounts and nevertheless the protein. We don't know about it because it's a processing aid rather than an ingredient on the labeling, such as the one from the companies we do. So precision fermentation is a game that is well known in the white biotechnology space. Most of the biotechnology we think about is red biotechnology, pharmaceutical or green, ag tech or blue uh, marine, uh, but we are in the commodity white biotechnology space. Great, thank you for that. We have a couple questions that have come in. Brent asks, have you collected the stability data for acidic systems to back up your stability claims? Yes, we have very high stability to acidic environments. And just as an example, if you will Google our name and Google Ocean Spray, you'll see that Ocean Spray put out a press release about the collaboration with us. And as you all know, um, cranberry juice is very acidic and we have no stability issues whatsoever in cranberry juice. Basically all of the beverages with their acidity, we are totally fine with them. We are also fine with all of the pasteurization schemes. Let's talk about what we are not. At this moment with the current, um, on Toronto that we are putting out, we are still not good enough for applications which need prolonged very high temperatures such as oven application, baking or hot extrusion. That's something that we hope in next generations we will also tackle. We are also a very 
um, high intensity sweetener and consequently in places where sugar is used as a bulking agent or a texturizing agent or um, that's things where we don't replace sugar. Thank you, that's very helpful. We have another question from Peter Hawthorne. Peter asks, please say more about your approach to regulatory approval, i.e. self-affirmed grass and to manufacturing scale up. Two very good questions. Um, so um, Igal Gesundheit is our chief production officer and um, Dr. Yael Lifshitz is our director of clinical and regulatory affairs. As to the clinical part, we don't need to do any clinical trials for getting the regulatory approval, but in order to substantiate the healthfulness uh, claims, we are um, launching some clinical trials. As to the regulatory track, um, this is as a new field, different agencies see it in a different way. And actually our international go-to-market is largely set by the regulatory landscape. We are beginning in the United States and the standard way in the US is to begin with a self grass. Some companies don't go beyond that, but in our business uh, usual cases, you um, put out a self grass, which legally allows you to sell. And then the same documents that you do for the self grass, you actually go and submit to the FDA. And a year later, you get the FDA, no questions asked letter, which is actually the FDA uh, grass generally regarded as safe. In other places, you have other uh, systems and actually the first country to approve alternative proteins as meat replacements is Singapore. We are going to Singapore after the United States and then South America, Europe and other countries. So for that, we are doing everything that is needed. And actually, I have shown you, we already have numerous fee-bearing agreements. And with all of these companies, the biggest hurdle in order to move to work is actually to show them our uh, safety data sheet and our very uh, long certificate of analysis. We did very comprehensive allergenicity, digestibility according to the InfoGest protocol, uh, and um, of course, full characterization of impurities. One more thing to note is that we have a protein. We don't have a small molecule. And proteins are different categories from small molecules because proteins are just a string of beads called amino acids. And what can go wrong with them? Proteins can be toxic, such as venomous snake toxin or scorpion toxin, and we know this is not the case. They can be allergenic. We know this is not the case. We did with the most sophisticated ways to show that there is no allergenicity whatsoever. And in some very high dosages, which is even not the case for us, um, they can potentially interfere with some uh, hormones which are peptide-based and peptides is a small protein. We also know this is not the case. In our case, we are still doing some studies that the FDA has requested to double check everything, but basically, we are very confident about the safety of what we do. Uh, so that's as to the regulatory front. As to the scale-up front, we actually have here at Amai's other side of this corridor, we have a uh, pilot lab with fermenters um, of 100 liter, 20 liter, and others, a bunch of smaller fermenters. We also have a spray drying uh, system and spray drying is a very cost efficient way. You need to uh, put very small uh, spray droplets and then you put on them uh, quite high temperature but for a short time and it does not affect the stability of our protein. And then you get the white powder. The white powder we, we don't put into any refrigerator or anything. It can be in, um, in just outside with out any problem because we can withstand quite high temperatures. So with this in mind, from the 100 liter, you can go directly to 100 cubic meters or up to 500 cubic meters. And uh, for that, what is done, and you can look on all the companies that I've noted that are doing uh, precision fermentation ingredients is usually you work with contract manufacturing organizations, whether it is through a contract manufacturing uh, 
collaboration or some level of joint venture for uh, production and for sometimes also distribution, blending sales and so on. And we are following up with that. We are talking with quite a few companies in this space and finalizing some uh, agreements. Obviously, we also are looking into building our own line as in the future, we will need our own dedicated line for um, to, to here's a supply. You need um, uh, CMOs that already have the experience of selling to the big companies. And in some cases, you even need to have a, a stable production line. And the way we are looking at all of that, each thing is in a different timeline in accordance with our go-to-market and sales uh, strategy. Great. An anonymous attendee asks, can any protein source be used in the procedural process to make them sweeter? I must say, I don't understand the question. Uh, sweetness on the molecular level is a pretty simple thing. If you take four carbons and you put on them four hydroxyls, you get a molecule called erythritol. If you take six carbons and you put them in a certain way and put on them six hydroxyls, you get glucose or fructose, whether it is a um, six atom ring or five atom ring. Uh, those are not too difficult. And within amino acids, you have quite a few amino acids with hydroxyls on them. You have in nature uh, 200 sweet proteins. Even the protein that is in our tears is sweet. It is masked by the salt that is in our tears, but it is sweet, but only low sweetness. Um, I showed you in a slide half a dozen of proteins which are hyper sweet, and that's an important thing. Those are all proteins which are between 700 and 3,000 times sweeter than sugar. Actually, the dose response is not always linear. In our case, a uh, threshold of sweetness is with a potency of 16,000, and as you go to higher bricks level, higher sugar percent equivalent, you get to a uh, lower uh, potency. So, um, so no, most proteins are not sweet. You need very specific proteins to be sweet. And in our case, we uh, design novel proteins that mimic the um, sweet proteins found in the wild, but are extremely stable. Great. Well, Dr. Samish, um, how can the audience both here live and those listening retroactively, how can they help you? Um, how would someone get in contact with you if they could help? So we are definitely looking for partnerships. When I opened the company with um, the Kitchen Hub incubator of the Strauss Group and Strauss Group, their partners are uh, PepsiCo and Danone who became our first partners. I looked for industry partners and we are now looking and actually in these days, um, signing more joint development agreements in order to um, help companies and, and get acquainted and, and do their first product together with them. So we are very much looking into collaborations, joint development agreements, um, companies that will help us with the initial go to market and later with uh, the sales. We are looking for production. We are looking for all the things around us where there is uh, synergy. And I'm happy to talk with anyone interested. And you can um, touch base with me through um, my email, first name dot last name at amyproteins.com. So Elon, that's dot Samish at amyproteins.com. Terrific. Well, thank you, Dr. Samish, and, and congrats on the, all the progress. Um, very interesting stuff. And uh, I'd like, also like to thank the audience for your active participation. Uh, we do host these agri-food conversations every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central. And again, this month's theme is food ingredients. Um, so if you want to share this with a friend, uh, we welcome you to do so. Um, they can sign up at agrifoodconversations.com and they can access the, the hundreds of conversations we've done in the past and uh, register for upcoming agri-food conversations as well. Um, so with that, I hope everyone has a great evening, great afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Tom. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. Take care.